receiving input before we have general discussions after lunch. It gives me great pleasure to be a program director for this event. As we know, Mpumalanga is the heartbeat of the energy center of the country. It is, in fact, the engine room, the backbone, without which our entire country's economic, mining, industrial, and indeed social context will not be supported. However, we also know that as a result of climate change, as a result of the necessity to make our contribution as the world itself moves to a greener future, we also have to play our role. It is in this context that I want to say that this gathering is perhaps the most important component of what we now know to be a just transition that we have to make. In this room, the people representing institutions, organizations, business, community, who together need to find a consensus and a united path as we trudge towards 2050 and an objective of having a much greener space to our economy and society. Needless to say, the recent flood in Fazulu Natal also points to the real truth that climate change is in fact upon us and that we together need to map a course that ensures that we not only play our part in a global journey, but that we do it in a way that meets the socio-economic developmental needs of South Africa, as we ourselves develop to create more jobs, have more growth, and create communities that are climate resilient and which have a real chance of developing new livelihoods as we unchart or unfold this journey. It gives me great pleasure to call on our first speaker for the second session, um, and that is Mr. Andre Deveta, the CEO of ESCOM. As he comes up, I will introduce him. Over a 30 year career, Mr. Deveta has started an executive and strategic course in his journey. He has had numerous experiences in turning around companies. He has also been a store in the coal industry. He now has what might be described as one of the most challenging jobs in the country. That is to ensure that our beloved ESCOM, that it is absolutely critical that ESCOM, which is at the heart of our economy and our industrial complex providing energy succeeds and that ESCOM itself undergoes the process of contributing, especially in this region, to a just energy transition. Andrew. Thank you so much for hosting us today at a very auspicious and important event. We really appreciate the leadership in putting together a summit to address the energy transition and the response of your province to this is indeed, I think, an example of visionary leadership on your part and the part of your cabinet to put us together in the same room. Uh, to get uh, a common view and a common purpose that we can move forward to enabling a just energy transition. Also, good morning. Uh, sorry, can we get a little less echo? Uh, um, right, that's better. So, uh, very good morning also to all the other dignitaries, the MECs, the executive mayors, the ambassadors. Uh, various colleagues from uh, 
and a bit of legal financing institutions who are very important partners to us. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for the opportunity of addressing you today on response perspectives on the just energy transition. George Bernard Shaw, the famous English author, said, the reasonable man adapts himself to the world. The unreasonable man persists in trying to adapt the world to himself. And we are on the cusp of an energy revolution in the world. And that energy revolution will not leave South Africa untouched. There are five key trends that characterize the energy transition, the energy revolution. And these are decarbonization, a move to lower carbon emitting forms of electricity generation, that's inevitable. Democratization, so greater access, greater choice. Decentralization, and there's, a, there's a good old Afrikaans word for a power station, it's called a plant center. So it's an old centralized large plant. But with renewable technology, we are now able to ensure that we can democratize and distribute the generation of electricity to all who need it and to address the great challenge also of energy poverty. Digitalization, smart meters, far more transparent billing, um, billing. Those of you who don't pay us, that's, that's the document that you get before you need to pay. As you can cut, Steve Trader can cut. Steve Trader, by the way, pays very regularly. Um, and, and they also do regulation. There is this tendency um, of, of, of good bureaucrats when they see anything that moves, they want to regulate it. And that very really often slows down innovation, slows down development. And the more that we deregulate, the more innovation can flourish. And the private sector and private investors can come up with innovative solutions to our nation's problems. So to echo what I'm sure, I want to believe that we are a reasonable people. And when we are confronted with these changes, we will take a reasonable stance and work towards grasping this solution. Now, history is repeat with various transitions. Uh, if, you, if you look at the, the mobile phone, uh, at a mere 20 years ago, no one would have imagined that, that we would be carrying this much computing power in our pockets. Yet today it's a reality that uh, we accept as common. Now, this is an important example also for the energy industry. The energy industry is also characterized by enormous advances in technology development. If you look at the prices realized by Good Window 1, they were for the renewable energy program, they were significantly more expensive than the cost of coal. The latest results from Good Rounds 5 and also for Window 6. The front end at substantially below the cash cost. The cash cost, forget about depreciation, the cash cost of generating electricity from coal. So, this is an indication that the green revolution has overtaken the electricity generation industry as well. Now, we have two responses to this fight or flight. We can uh, say that this is a threat to uh, our current reality, what we know, or we can embrace it and see it as an opportunity. There is uh, a saying that says, the stone age didn't end because of the lack of stones. And I would venture to say that the coal age also didn't end because of the lack of coal, and it will be overtaken by technology. And that technology today is available. And it is, it is competitive with the physical forms of electricity generation. You may be aware that you would have driven, those of you who came in from Kwarteng, you would have driven past off the CD power station. And you would have seen that there are three lights on at that time. 
uh, it is substantially overstated, it is significantly behind schedule, and unfortunately, that mega project has been characterized by extensive fraud, decline, and corruption, uh, which came with the years of state capture. And I think we shouldn't deny that mega projects generally are very prone to this type of corruption and capture. I'm not saying that renewable energy somehow is clean and therefore it is immune to corruption, but it is far more difficult to engage in these corrupt activities when you roll out modular plants on a smaller scale rather than trying to build these mega projects. As my colleague from Sassel will confirm, building mega projects is a really difficult thing. It's not a South African thing, this is a university. Now, ESCOM is by no means anti coal. We are a very large coal consumer, one of the largest coal consumers in the world, and we will remain a large coal consumer for an extended period of time to come. In fact, we see there is shut down only in 2071. But if you exclude the two new plants that we built, the DPM to see there, the average age of our plants is now in excess of 43 years. And these plants have been run very hard, they haven't been well maintained, and they are therefore unstable and unreliable, as you can all see by voting from this unfortunate phenomenon called load shedding. And we therefore have an opportunity, as we have to replace this generation capacity with new capacity that we can access concessional green financing at much lower interest rates, and in some instances, even at extended payment holidays, to ensure that when we build back the required new capacity, that we build back better. This is the opportunity that I see for Mpumalanga. Because Mpumalanga, the land of the rising sun, is richly endowed with three major resources. First of all, it's endowed with human resources. There are many technically skilled, capable, competent people unemployed in Mpumalanga today, and specifically in the coal belt. And that should not be seen as a problem. That should be seen as an opportunity, as a resource that renewable energy developers can access in order to start their plants and to help to build renewable energy facilities in the province. And ESCO itself is playing a role with the assistance of our partners in creating a training center at our Kumaki power station that will reskill and upskill people displaced from the coal mining value chain to be trained to be photovoltaic technicians, to be trained in how to install solar panels, how to plan a power station, uh, solar power station, and then also the same for wind turbines. And I think this is an example of how we can take our coal shovels and we can beat them into wind turbine blades. Point now, ironically, what we are faced with is a concerted fight back campaign by people with vested interests in the coal region. You will have seen media reports of extensive sabotage at some of our houses. This is completely deplorable, and to my mind, utterly incomprehensible that anybody would want to deprive hospitals, schools, businesses, factories, homes of electricity to act for sabotage. The irony, of course, is that those individuals who engage in these acts by the uh, criminal acts that they perpetrate are in fact accelerating the demise of coal by making coal less reliable and therefore less effective. Um, the, the law enforcement authorities will have a significant role to play in helping us to literally arrest the spring and also arrest the perpetrators. And I would again request that we all engage in making sure that the criminals don't take over this province of the
Now, I hope that I've illustrated that the energy transition itself is inevitable, and it cannot be reversed. But to make it just, to make it just from a social perspective, an economic perspective, is a real challenge. And that is what we need to do. That is the choice that we have. Now, ESCOM has the option, in a very simple way, of putting a padlock on the gates of our power plants as we shut them down. Say thank you very much to the community that have supported us for 50, 60 years and walk away and go and build new power plants in the Northern Cape. But this is an option that we deliberately decided not to take. And hence, we are focusing and repurposing and repowering our existing power plants. We want to attract new skills, new investment, come and work uh, at our existing council. And that brings me to uh, the second endowment that Mulanda has, and that is access to the grid. Today, Mulanda is the owner of an extensive network of transmission lines connecting our coal fired power stations to the electricity market, which is still predominantly in the market. It will take this one with its unbundled transmission entity more than 10 years to build a new transmission grid down to the Northern Cape, which is where many of our investors would prefer to go. So, Kumalanga has a built in advantage to access the existing transmission grid. They are modest efficiency losses because Kumalanga is not the most ideal location. But I read recently that a country that I'm very familiar with, the Netherlands, is going to massively embark on a solar project. And uh, apologies to colleagues from the, from the Dutch industry who are here as well. Um, but the weather there is not so great. And the solar radiation is really important. But yet the Dutch have decided that this is, this is what they want to do. Now, the, the worst solar radiation in South Africa is orders of magnitude better than anything available in Europe with the exception of Spain. So, ladies and gentlemen, we are sitting here on an opportunity where the third advantage, the endowment of natural resources in terms of solar radiation and wind in the London, are really attractive. And we capitalize. But how do we capitalize it? We need concerted policy action. I was uh, very fortunate to have a uh, big opportunity to engage with the Premier. And we, we had a really productive discussion on the steps that we can take to make it attractive for manufacturers of renewable energy components to come and set up their factories in Kumala to create jobs. The skills are here, and I'm sure that with the Premier's assistance, we will be able to get the policy support to declare an area in the longer, hopefully in the Volga, a special economic zone for the manufacturing of renewable energy. And I think it's very important that we in this room, who are going to the vision, should advocate it. Uh, it should not only come from ESCOM, but it should come from all who agree with this vision that we can create jobs in the forest, which is where we are now. Now, we also have a strange anomaly in that the Malapeni municipality has been declared a race, a renewable energy development zone, which gives the opportunity to have a very accelerated. Uh, environmental impact assessment process completed in only six months as opposed to the 18 to 24 months that are normally done. And I think there's a great case to be made for Steve Trejo municipality to be declared a red as well. To allow us to still be responsible to the environment, but also to be able to get the megawatts on the grid sooner by making it easier for investors to come 
and connect to the good. The Premier very graciously referred in a speech to ESCOM's program to make available land in Kumalonga to private investors who want to make available of the uh, recent announcement by the President to uh, build less than 100 megawatt power plants um, without having to go through an onerous licensing process. Uh, it would be very productive and supportive of NOSA if they can maybe revisit their registration process to make it as, as easy as possible to get uh, these projects registered. But in a period of five months, we went as ESCOM from uh, the identification of land, identification of potential grid access running, uh, an accelerated process for which we've got 21 different bids from really credible developers of these projects, and we aim to have an award to the successful bidder by the end of June. So in a period of five months, we, we, we did what has taken and other entities uh, five years to do. So it's, um, it's something that I think demonstrates what we can do if we put our shoulder to the wheel. The, the opportunity that we have uh, with our partners from all over the globe, from South Africa and the in particular, to become a flagship for a just energy transition is really enormous. And I can give the Premier and the colleagues the assurance that when they engage with uh, representatives, particularly of the European nations, they will find partners who are committed and dedicated to ensuring that this transition doesn't go. Doesn't affect that place. And thank you, Ambassador. Thank you also for your support. But we do need to ensure that we are, we don't repeat the mistakes of the past. And therefore, good governance is going to be critical. The era of state capture is still fresh in our memories and it's left great scars on our nation. And in particular, it's their great scars in ESCOM as an organization. And when we roll out this, this new funding initiative, when we roll out this new great opportunity, it will be very important for us to demonstrate to those who support us that we can spend money responsibly, wisely, and without threatening corruption. Premier, if I can conclude by quoting from the motto of Kumalanga, which is Omnia Labo Nip, which for those of you who want to say in Latin, um, means labor will conquer all. And I think that's a very apt note to say that if we all together work hard, we can overcome the challenges, we can make use of the opportunities, and we can build a new energy industry in the land of the rising sun. Premier, thank you very much. Andre, thank you, thank you so much. Without wanting to paraphrase you, I just want to say that you've gotten in that short address to the heart of the issue part of the list, but also the heart of the opportunity that lies ahead of us. This green cluster agency, with all the social partners, including business, community, and government, will work tirelessly to bring all parties together. Andre, you sketched a picture for us that puts ESCOM at front and center the heart of the Nkuma Langas as well as the country's just energy transition. Honorable Premier, you and the provincial government, together with the people of Nkuma Langa, working together, can realize this dream and make it happen. Thank you, Andrew. Admin announcement. Someone with a VW Polo, no 
registration NHL 862 MP. The front window is open. 